Thanks. 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 Please be seated. I think it's interesting uh, as we look at this passage to note that people were amazed at the authority that Jesus commanded. He had great authority. He even spoke to the unclean spirits and they obeyed him. Uh, and, and we can all think of many occasions where the power of Jesus was seen in healing and the raising of the dead. Um, and it, it just is over and over and over again evidenced throughout the gospel that Jesus had great power and authority. And the people began to recognize it and they were astounded, they were amazed because no one that they had experienced had ever had this kind of authority before. They were used to the scribes and the Pharisees and the prophets of old who, like us, were human and being human, fallible. We are sinful people. We can't help it. That's what we are. But here is Jesus with authority, great authority. And they are amazed because they haven't seen this before. He reminds them, as the psalmist tells us today, that they have been given great skill and ability and knowledge to do wonderful things themselves. And as we see in Deuteronomy this morning, many of them misused that and that resulted in their being deported to foreign lands, losing what they had because they put their own interests before those of God before those of the people in need around them. We tend, a lot of us, you know, and, and I fall into this too, to live this way. You know, we've been brought up with that idea that the guy who dies with the most, or oh, girl too, we don't want to be, uh, we, we don't want to leave the girls out here. The guy or the girl that li li dies with the most toys wins, you know. Uh, we've, we've been given that attitude that in, if you want to be successful in this world, you have to have a lot of stuff, and you have, that stuff will make you happy. And Jesus comes telling people that that's not the way it is, and reminding them of what has happened to them in the past when they have lived their lives that way. We hear this and we understand it, but it doesn't always sink in. You know, it's interesting, we've been watching this week, because uh, they happen right down the street from where we live, the, uh, the cheerleading uh, tournaments. And the newspaper, Bangor Daily News, these last uh, week or so, has been filled with, you know, this school and that school, and boy, they, they, they are getting trophies and winning and going on to the states. But there's never a mention of any of the other teams and groups of cheerleaders who didn't make it to the tournaments, who didn't get a trophy because they did their best. You know, they got a trophy because they were the best, not because they did the best. You know, and I saw this as a school teacher and principal. You know, kids would come home after they got their rank pads and they'd say, I took my rank pad home and I got a dollar for every A that I had. You know, we encourage that. And there's nothing wrong with encouraging students and kids to do their best, to be the best they can. But it's always important that we also teach them that with that success comes a responsibility. You know, if you are the best, if you climb to the top of a ladder, part of your responsibility is to look back at the people who are still on the ground and give them a hand up the ladder too. But all too often, we get to the top of the ladder and we get so enamored with all of 
the view from the top of the ladder that we forget all of those people that are down trying to get up as well. There will be an accounting. You know, there are too many times when I think about the things that I've done and I thought, oh, 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 I'm going to have to stand before the throne of God and say, yep, that was me. And then there are all those things that I should have done that I didn't do that I'm going to say, <laughs> yep, that was me. I forgot to do this or I didn't do this or I got too busy with my own life to remember that there were responsibilities that I had to the other people in the world around me, there will be an accounting. It's been interesting since we're talking about accountability to watch the news in the football world the last couple of weeks. Um, <laughs> I thought the greatest thing this week was that they were going to take the question of air pressure to Columbia University to talk to the physics professor about gas physics. Uh, you know, and it's interesting because as an elementary school science teacher, I taught about the fact that if you take and something that's inflated inside, outside, it's going to deflate a little, you know? That was elementary. Anyway. I, it was, that's, I'm, I'm getting off on a little tangent here, but I've been like, really kind of crazy about this. As I can see some of you shaking your heads, probably you have been too. Um, during all of this, one of the comments that was made really impressed me. Aaron Rodgers, quarterback for the Green Bay Packers, was quoted this last week after as responding to someone from the Seattle Seahawks saying, we won the NFC Championship because God was on our side. And Aaron Rodgers' reply was wonderful. He said, I don't think God cares too much about how the football game comes out. God cares about people. God doesn't care, I mean, He wants to see us all happy and successful and, and, you know, doing the best we can, but He doesn't care if we win. Winning for Him would be for us to behave in such a way that as Christine Arnold, who we prayed for this morning, who was a, a uh, parishioner of mine, used to say, so that we can go all the way up. She said, I want to go all the way up. And the way we get to go all the way up is by remembering that we're not on earth to win. Fame, fortune, prizes, trophies, money, homes. We're not here to gather all that stuff. I have a number of years ago, we used to have a strawberry festival in Lincoln, and it was in August, and the basement of the church would get so hot with all of the people coming in for that strawberry festival that the floor would actually, there would be water on the floor, not because anybody tracked it in, but because just the humidity in there would condense on that floor and it would be, would be covered with water. We had living next door to our, the parsonage was the local uh, physician, uh, surgeon for the local hospital. Uh, and he, uh, he, was a, he was a Muslim, and, but a wonderful, wonderful gentleman. And we used to eat, go over to his house and he'd come over to the parsonage and we would talk about religion and life and everything. So he came to the Strawberry Festival. And he was, he was doing this, you know, this thing. and he said, don't you people have an air conditioner? And I said, no, we don't, we can't, you know, it's just not something we can afford. So he went out and bought one for us. At the same time, this, this was in, you know, in the fall, we finally got around to buy it and finally came in the winter. And, and we, we didn't have it installed until the summer, but 
during that time, he, he came from Philadelphia, and his home in Philadelphia froze up, and all the pipes, in the, you know, pipes burst and water ran everywhere in the house. Somebody, he said 10,000 gallons of water running through his house, and the city charged him for the water on top of everything else. Um, so I said to him, I said, you know, if it's too much to pay for the, the air conditioner, you know, I'd be happy to, you know, we can wait on that, you know, if, if you need the money to fix your house and pay the water bill and all of that. And he looked at me and said, we, we were right across the street from the funeral home, he looked across the street and he said, you know, I've never seen a hearse pour out of there with a U-Haul behind it. You can't take it with you. And he knew that. And even in the situation that he found himself, he knew that it was better to give than to hang on to what he had and try to preserve what he had. We are called to be Christians in our hearts. We are called to be like Jesus in our hearts. We are called to be more loving in our hearts. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. And that means that we have to remember that as we become successful, as we gather things and finances to ourselves, that there are people around us that we must remember. And we must give of what we have so that they can climb the ladder too. Amen? Amen. Uh, amen? Amen. Thank you. <laughs> We were in the moment. <laughs> so we remember that there are those things today you when know, we come for communion and we remember, you know, there are those things that I've done that I shouldn't have done, yeah. You know? And there are those things I should have done that I didn't do, you know. And we know in, from that first song that there will be a strict accounting. That first hymn says there will be an accounting for what we have done. But the good news about that accounting is that we will have a lawyer to go to court with us. Did you know that? We will have a lawyer to go to court with us. And he will stand up there with us and say, Oh, but, but God, they asked for forgiveness. And I died and gave my blood so that they could get that forgiveness. So remember that, God that you said that if they were forgiven by my blood, that everything on their record would be wiped off. So, come today, remember that Jesus has died for you. Partake of the Holy Communion and receive the forgiveness that has been yours since he was born, lived, died, and resurrected so that you might receive it. As we come to this communion table, we remember that on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and gave it to them and said, this is my body which is broken for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and eat all of this. And as you do so, remember me. Remember what I've done. Likewise, after the meal, he took the cup. And after he had said a blessing over it, he gave it to them and he said, Drink from this. Drink from this, all of you. And as you do so, remember that I have bled for you. And this blood is forming a new covenant between God and you. A covenant that guarantees the forgiveness of your sin. Let us pray. Lord, we ask your Holy Spirit to be present with us this morning. We pray that you would be here in this place that your spirit would enter us 
and enter these elements of bread and wine that they might become for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ. That as we receive it and are forgiven, we in turn might be that spirit, that body, that holy witness in the world for you in all we say and do. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. I always like to share the story of the grape juice. Is this Welch's grape juice? Yes. Is it? That's great. You know why it's great? Because Thomas Welch was a Methodist. And he was kind of upset that we couldn't have wine. They used to serve water because Methodists didn't drink alcoholic beverages. And he was upset that we, didn't, we couldn't have wine with communion. And so he developed a way to make wine without alcohol. Welch's grape juice from Thomas Welch. It's a great story. It's a great story. I... <laughs> you had to say that, didn't you? Yes, you did. So, we know that in the Methodist Church, communion is open to all, no matter what their affiliation. If they truly seek to repent of the things that they have done, the sins that they have committed, the burdens that they carry, to leave them at God's and Christ's feet, and to walk away and live a new life. So I invite you to come forward and to receive this. To leave your burdens and your cares and your sins here and let Christ wash them away. That you may be new and go out and live a new life.